talking over the tone. So anyhow, that's what that's all about. And speed. Good morning. For the Heritage Group of IATSE 659, this is Jay Nefsey, and I'm here with Howie Block and Bob Feller, and we're at the home of the distinguished cinematographer, Conrad Hall. <laughs> Good morning, Conrad. That was, is that a traditional morning, greeting? I, it's actually just cleaning my ears out. Uh, the uh, vibration is great for the ears. <laughs> it's all the wax, loose wax out of, the, uh, out of your ears. Yeah, well, what is uh, that kind of? Actually, that was not a very good blow. Let me try another one. <laughs> Excellent, excellent. All right, what's up, guys? Well, first I want to thank you for allowing us into your home to uh, be part and being part of the Heritage Series. Our Heritage Series is oral history. What we're trying to do is establish oral history for the local and to uh, uh, get the story of people who made the local as great as it is in their own words, in their own style. Uh, good to be a part of it. Well, you're, you've always been a favorite of ours, Conrad. <laughs> Well, in our oral histories, what we do is we start with a uh, uh, little introductory history, where you come from, what uh, sort of education background you have, how you got into the industry, what interested you to, to be a cinematographer, and then we'll talk uh, a little bit about uh, oh, tech things, you know, uh, we'll talk about what movies you've made, some of the actors, some of the experiences you've had with uh, directors, um, and any other gossip you want to talk about. Good deal. Sounds like a deal? Yeah. All right. So let's get uh, into it. The beginning. All the right. beginning, yeah. Uh, it started back in 1948. Um, could have been 47, late 47. Um, I signed up at USC to uh, finish my last two years of college. I didn't really know what I wanted to do with my life, but uh, my dad was a writer, so I uh, decided that maybe I'd find out if there were a few genes left around uh, <laughs> rattling loose, and, and I signed up for a uh, journalism major. Now, he, your dad was a rather famous writer. He had written yeah, uh, he was, Mutiny uh, on actually, the Bounty, uh, someone told me? a very you? famous writer, uh, a very good one, too. He wrote Mutiny on the Bounty and uh, um, Men Against the Sea and Hurricane and a lot of films, a lot of novels that were made into films, actually. Uh, um, it was a Humphrey Bogart film, Passage to Marseille, uh, that uh, mm -hmm. Michael Curtiz directed. Uh, well, what, what, in your youth, did, did he ever go on the sets and was involved in movie no, making himself? No, 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 no. He, he had a great disregard for, <laughs> oh, <really? laughs> for film. And, um, you know, that's how writers are, and uh, some of them. And in any case, uh, um, so I signed up to find out if there were any genes rattling around. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, at the end of a semester uh, in a course called Creative Writing, <laughs> I got a D plus uh, grade. And uh, it's passing, but not if your major is uh, journalism. So I decided uh, maybe I didn't have those genes rattling. <laughs> and uh, decided, looked at the uh, liberal arts and science manual, decided to keep a passing grade uh, and look for another major. And it's A, astronomy, B, biology, C, cinema. And I stopped right then and there and wondered uh, whether this was a possibility to study cinema in school and an academic surrounding and that kind of thing. It didn't sound like academics to me, but uh, it sounded interesting. I liked the idea of traveling. I loved the movie stars. Uh, um, I loved going to the movies. Um, I thought of what a wonderful life it might be to be involved in that. But that's really all basically kind of the wrong reasons uh, until I got into it and until I got a camera in my hand and until I exposed some film and until I saw it on a screen until it looked back at me and I said to myself, wow, did I do that? So it exposed and, some of those creative genes then? 
Well, it, uh, it, 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 it made me understand what a great possibility it was to like use to tell a story uh, without like having to um, spell and uh, correctly, um, no English grammar uh, precisely and things like that. So I had a, an immediate love affair with the, uh, with the power of the visual image and its ability to tell a story because I had made a little, uh, we had 100 feet per semester in those days. Mm. And, uh, Gave you a lot of footage to work <laughs> with. <laughs> and I made a little tiny film out of that and, and um, it, it, it was, it turned me on to, uh, uh, to the possibility of cinema. Well, also though, studying though, uh, in the, in 19, by 1948, not that many people came out of film school to become cinematographers. They, they, they came out of film school and maybe worked in an advertising agency or something. It well, didn't, that's it true. I, I, I never intended to be a cinematographer, mm -hmm. uh, actually. That was, that's another story. Uh, that was, uh, what happened is that um, I studied for a year and a half, having spent uh, half the year studying journalism. Um, the other year and a half, uh, uh, I spent studying cinema mm -hmm. uh, under Slavko Vorkovich mm -hmm. with uh, great teachers. Uh, we had John Hewson coming down and we had um, all kinds of wonderful uh, people from the industry uh, talking about film and, and getting us excited about it and uh, telling us uh, um, their experiences and, and how they did it. And uh, I made a little film with uh, two other fellow students, which uh, we submitted to an ASC International Photographic Contest mm. and won first prize. All right. Um, and so uh, when I got out of school at, in 1949, June of 49, I graduated uh, from cinema, uh, we took that film. Television was just starting. And I took that film and cut it. Uh, it was a 19-minute film, I believe. It was called Sea Theme. Mm -hmm. And I think the department still probably has a copy of it. I'm not sure. And in any case, uh, we cut it down, put uh, cleared music on it, and um, sold it to television. Because television was just coming in in those days, 1949. Mm -hmm. It was all black and white. Uh, there were all these hours to be filled and nothing, no material. Films weren't like yet bought uh, from uh, from major studios to uh, to put on, and uh, and there was a scramble to like fill the time, and anything was like anything. <laughs> well, also the established Hollywood people were turning their noses up to film. This is uh, they they would I mean it's, uh, they're turning, they were turning their yeah. nose up to television. They didn't really like television. Yeah. They thought it was a threat, exactly. and and so maybe this this is an opportunity. Dennis the Menace and Leave It to Beaver and all that kind of stuff in yeah. those days, and. Uh, um, which by now, which is coming around to be feature films. Sure, Re the remake of the, the, the film version. The remake of Dennis the Menace. Yeah. Um, so you got out of college. I mean, you got a good grounding though. I mean, you had people explaining how uh, uh, montage was put together. Think about film school. I recommend it for for everybody because uh, film school uh, is about uh, learning everything about film: mm -hmm. art direction, writing, uh, screenwriting, uh, editing, photography. Uh, directing, uh, production, the whole works. We learned everything. We studied it, all of it. We studied the history of film. We studied documentary filmmaking. Uh, we worked in all aspects so that when you get out of school, you, you're basically a little rounded filmmaker of some kind. And uh, not knowing which direction to branch out in because being such a, a diverse uh, medium, uh, you can't like do it all. Mm -hmm. But you can know it all. And I always wanted to be a filmmaker, to tell stories, uh, direct that means, I guess, uh, and, uh, and I was very happy to know a little bit about a lot of things. And we took that film, the two other students and myself who made that, Jack Coffer and Mar Weinstein, and we cut it into 13 minutes so it would fit into a 15 minute time slot, sold it to uh, television and started a company called Canyon Films. And, oh, really? And uh, got uh, immediately uh, a series to do and... Um, what and was, what was the series? Do you recall the name of the series? Uh, 
I don't right now. But what was it, like, what was uh, it about? It was a well, it was about uh, there were several series that we were involved in. I worked on Paul Coates series for a while, and um, um, were these travelogues or were they uh, 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 dramatic? You know something? There's so many. We did one for for Disney, which was called When I Grow Up, mm -hmm. um, and uh, then there was but the one. It was about interesting occupations. I know. I remember that. But mm -hmm. I can't remember what we called it. Mm -hmm. In any case, uh, so, so so it was interviewing people and talking about yeah, what they did yeah. for a living. Mm -hmm. And we did document. We did the dory fisherman and, mm -hmm. uh, and a couple of other things like that. So and that would like you know that went into in the television. Now, um, meanwhile, we were writing, not getting paid very much. Um, starting families and all of that kind of thing, and uh, um, so we did everything. When we weren't uh, editing or, uh, or shooting documentaries or um, stealing film for major studios who would run out of money and uh, then hire non-union talent to mm -hmm. uh, to like um, finish twenty percent of their picture, I must have shot. 20% of 100 Hollywood movies. Oh, no kidding. <laughs> in those days. Yeah. And, uh, and so I found out that like what I could do was as good as what like somebody who was in the profession. So you got and, right into 35 and, millimeter. Huh? You got right into 35 millimeter. Immediately. 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 Okay. But, yeah, I got into 35 millimeter immediately by becoming the West Coast, West, Western Hemisphere distributor of uh, Aeroflex camera. Oh, really? A Smart. Friend of mine, who had also been to USC Cinema, Dick Moore, had been to Germany and had gotten Arnold and Richter to, uh, after the war, he went and, and visited them and said, uh, you've got a wonderful combat camera there. Uh, we'd like to have the, uh, I'd like to have the, uh, the, the Western Hemisphere rights to that. And they said, why not? Huh? Uh, they were just defeated by the American uh, and allied troops. So uh, he got it, he came over here, he didn't have any money. I had 900 bucks wandering around, and I uh, put up that money to buy the demonstrator. Mm -hmm. We bought a demonstrator, uh, and we took it around to every studio, every camera department in town, MGM, Fox, the whole shebang. They all looked with disdain upon this camera. They said, what do we want a German uh, reflex camera for? We've got a perfectly good thing called an IMO, which <laughs> is the American combat camera, you see? And I said, yeah, but look, you can see through the lens. You see exactly what you're getting, not some like parallax view. And uh, <laughs> so um, we never sold the camera. Oh, you're After kidding. Year, you, did, you didn't Arnold sell it And Richter anybody? sent us a letter and said, gentlemen, thank you very much, but we're giving this to Kling. Uh, it's like losing the Volkswagen uh, <laughs> <laughs> franchise. Do you know what I mean? Luckily, I did. I got my camera. I got to use it. I got to find out uh, how, to, how to perfect the craft of cinematography. And uh, that's much better than like sitting there collecting money selling uh, Aeroflex. Sure. Anyway, uh, but the our company, that you introduced uh, it. we finally bought a story for 750 bucks in the Martha Foley collection called uh, My Brother Down There. And the minute we bought it, uh, Swifty Lazar, Irby Paul Lazar yes. mm -hmm. called us and said, uh, offered us 25 grand. We just paid $750 for it. We said, wow. Good return we on must that investment. We have something here. <laughs> yeah. huh? So, well, we knew we had something, and, but we didn't want to sell it. And money isn't the object. Making films is the object. So we wrote the script, we raised the money, and it came time to like, make a film. And in those days, there was a strong IATSE union. There was the CIO was here, and the AFL was there, and, and uh, we all wanted to direct. We all had written the script, got credit for it, um, but we all wanted to direct, and we knew we couldn't all direct by committee. Uh, so we chose the three jobs that we would like to have and wrote the names on a slip of paper, producer, director, and cinematographer. Guess which one I got. <laughs> and you pulled the cinematographer? I pulled the cinematography one. Wow. And uh, um, in those times, uh, 
the union was very strict, and um, but I, that was Taft Hartley, and I was going to uh, we're going to do it non-union, of course, and um, uh, or we would have signed the union contract, uh, but I would have to be the cinematographer, mm -hmm. and they said, well, we can't do that, and I said, well, Taft Hartley says the owner of a company can do anything he wants to it, so I pulled Taft Hartley on, him. and uh, and that like uh, got them all. Uh, squirrely about uh, about the law and uh, a possible lawsuit and uh, it, this went back and forth we were ready to leave for location and I was ready to photograph it and everything and they were going to pull the plug on me and I said you do and man you're gonna have the biggest lawsuit you ever saw in your life huh? because we've got money that money will be lost and etc 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 so Herb Aller, who was the <laughs> head of the union at that time, a famous guy, uh, said, look, Conrad, what do you want to make trouble for? He says, uh, and I said, I don't want to make trouble. I just want to photograph my film. And uh, he said, OK, I'll make you a deal. If you'll hire a cinematographer and like, uh, pay him and give him credit, when you get back from Colorado, I'll get you into the union. So that was a very devious thing, but I thought to myself, well, maybe, he said I could photograph it myself. As long as I did this other thing for a cinematographer, it was okay, I could like do the work myself. And all I wanted was the, was the credit, not the credit, but the, uh, the experience. The experience, yeah. So, uh, so I decided to join them rather than, uh, than fight for the rest of my lives. And, uh, I went back, I photographed the film, um, I paid the man, I gave him credit, he was very helpful, very, very nice man, he's dead now, but like, um, uh, we had a good time, and um, I got the experience, and I gave myself a credit of uh, uh, um, cinematographic supervisor. Oh, wonderful, wonderful. But that's how, so once you do something, and you do it pretty good, they want you to do it again. Yeah. And they, you know, you say, well, no, I'd rather do something else. And they pay you a little more money so they like you do it. And then pretty soon you're getting better at it. And then you're trying to quit and get back to what you really want to do, which is direct. Uh, and, but they won't let you. They just keep bumping your salary up so <laughs> you don't ever want to leave. And eventually you learn your craft pretty well. And um, I've enjoyed being a cinematographer. I like cinematography a lot. I know. I enjoy uh, what it is that I contribute to the telling of the story. And that's a very satisfying, uh, that's a very satisfying element uh, to be involved in. Uh, those pictures are mine. I did those. Well, and, uh, and like, uh, I know what that means to the movie. Yeah? That when you pan here and do that and go in there and uh, all of that kind of stuff, that, that's 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 telling the story and 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 um, and you can do it better or or not as good, uh, but bit by bit I learned my craft and I got pretty good at it and uh, all that kind of stuff and, um, and I gave up the idea of like being the director, but I haven't given up the idea of wanting to direct. Mm. And I will one day, and uh, I intend to. I'm sure you'll be good. But uh, I don't want to be a director. I, I, like, I love being a cinematographer. First, I think we should acknowledge something for the moment here. They are doing construction across the street from you. I think that that's a uh, good idea. What, it's a good idea. We'll acknowledge that so we understand yeah. that on the tape so we know it's not Bobby's mixing it's up the sound. It's a four-story building apartment and <laughs> built out of wood. And I would guess that the clear cut on it would probably be uh, what, 40 acres? At least. At least At 40 least. acres, huh? Yeah. All that plywood, two by fours, two by six, two mm. by twelves out there. Mm. It's amazing. Yeah. It's amazing. But we have to acknowledge that. So we, yeah, that's okay. the buzzing sound and the, and the pounding sound so that uh, Bob's off the hook now. Right. But I want to ask you, about what, yeah, about what year was this that, we, uh, that you uh, made this movie and that you... Uh, 55. About 55. So, so you really had to do a con job to get these, uh, the union to... Uh, well, you, you weren't conning them, they were conning but it was a... They were conning me. Yeah, they were kidding? conning you. They were oh, conning, they were yeah. conning me, absolutely, yeah. yeah. And, uh, um, but... Long before that, I mean, uh, long before this, uh, I, I belonged to another union. Ah. 
um, actually. Uh, when we got out of school, since they wouldn't let us into the union, um, fellows and ladies from UCLA and SC and, and the local uh, film schools in the area, not many at that time, mainly SC was the uh, important one, um, got together and formed uh, a group called the Association of Film Craftsmen. Ah. And we met in the cartoon building on what was uh, the, uh, was, what was Coenga before there was a freeway. Mm -hmm. uh, this was before the building of the freeway through uh, the Valley Pass. and Coenga Pass and, uh, uh, and on into Hollywood. And uh, we, uh, we were grips, electricians, we did everything. And uh, we worked for in the non-union field. Uh, but we were unionized and had a charter and all of that. Had your own group that was yeah, uh, exactly. wonderful. And, uh, but we, bet we kept getting harassed mm -hmm. by, uh, by the IA. And so uh, we didn't like that. We tried to understand what, how they could harass us because we were legitimate. We belonged, we, we had a uh, CIO uh, had charter, given us yeah. a, a charter yeah, and yeah. all of that kind of thing. And, and we were a legitimate union. Why, why should we be harassed? Well, they said they wouldn't show our pictures in the, un in the theaters and things like that. So we thought about it for a while. We found this outfit called NABET, National Association of Broadcasting Engineers for Television. Mm -hmm. And like all they did was thread up film for like uh, showing on television. And we started thinking about it and we thought to ourselves, wow, you mean, what if we joined them and, uh, and the IA said, well, we won't show your films on on, uh, in theaters. We could say, we won't show yours uh, on television. <laughs> and that's what happened. We joined them. Uh, they were very happy to have a live film group. They had oh, a yeah. live film group. And uh, we affiliated with them. And uh, it gave us some sort of legitim uh, legitimacy, uh, but not much, really. And then uh, finally, the CIO and the AFL merged, but stupidly they merged the A NABET and uh, the IA, uh, which like would have solved a whole lot of problems. Early for, on, yes. For um, for our union and their union. What eventually came to be, of course, was exactly. that which has eventually come to be. But. There are a lot of slow learners out there. <laughs> there are a bunch of slow learners out there. <laughs> there are a lot of slow learners oh, no. still yeah, out still. there. Huh? And most of them are like, uh, or lots of them are still in the union, and lots of them are elsewhere too. But like, uh, there are slow learners out there. Well, getting back to our history here, yeah. uh, you uh, got by about 1955, 56, did the, so did, made this picture. You right. made this picture, right? And, 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 and what happened is that at, just at that time, I had a falling out with Nabet, and so I left Nabet and joined the IA and became an assistant cameraman. Became assistant. Uh, I worked as an assistant for one year. Mm -hmm. In those days, uh, you only had to spend a year in each category. Mm -hmm. uh, foolishly, they changed that, but uh, then. Um, so I re-rated to operator after mm -hmm. a year. I operated for a year and re-rated first cameraman. Really? And so... Um, you fairly quickly went through the, through the ranks then? I, well, I started the first cameraman. Yes. I came out and shot a feature, um, my own, and one for somebody else called uh, uh, Edge of Fury. Mm -hmm. and, uh, it was Action, kind of adventure, cool. things? Uh, uh, it was a mystery, mystery. Uh, by Paul Coates. Mm -hmm. no, not Paul Coates, uh, Robert Coates who uh, was an art critic for the New Yorker magazine and wrote a novel called Wisteria Cottage. Mm -hmm. And uh, somebody bought the book and hired the three of us, Marv, Jack, and myself, and we did everything. Sam Zeba, another guy from UCLA, who sells Fords in, uh, in Israel now. <laughs> um, and, uh, and we went to South Carolina and shot a feature film. That was 1950, I think. Gee. Something like that. So, so they did, did everything, you know, climbed telephone poles and stole electricity off of wires and, uh, you know, all of that kind of thing. Real guerrilla shooting. Huh? Real guerrilla shooting. Real guerrilla shooting. That's uh, the only way to learn this thing. Yeah, Man, yeah. it's the best way to learn it, I think. That's the king of it. Best, best, best up, way to do it. The other way is, uh, I don't know, I appreciate the way I, uh, I was able to uh, learn my craft. 
Well, you, know, you, you, certainly, you certainly proved it as time went on. You, you, you moved into, back into the director of photography. Yeah. Your company still was going, so you, you had that, you kept moving with that too. They kept yeah. doing features. So well, this we had, we, we, we actually, the <laughs> we had been uh, together since graduation. Mm -hmm. So that was 49 and uh, in 59, uh, because of the, <laughs> of the feature that we had made. Uh, it was too much of a strain on all of us. Oh, the company fell apart? Yeah, the company fell apart. And uh, we, it was a strain because we all really wanted to like be in charge and, uh, <laughs> and it got sort of uh, uh, difficult. So we broke apart and I formed my own company again uh, called uh, Lafcadio Productions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And by this time I was doing commercials and documentaries and that kind of thing. Uh, had a little office up here on Sunset Boulevard. And that lasted for quite a while until um, I started uh, Wexler Hall Productions. With Haskell With Wexler. Haskell Wexler, mm -hmm. exactly. And um, those are the only three companies that I've, uh, that I've had. And now I like not being an entrepreneur. I love like Sitting here waiting for the phone. Waiting for the phone to ring, just working. <laughs> but it but it worked well for you though, because as an entrepreneur, you got your you kept your fingers in, in different pies. You got 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 a chance to do the Absolutely. commercial business as opposed to just waiting for the telephone to ring. Absolutely no. You got to be active in this business. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you're not, you should. Uh, for me, no matter whether you're a director or a cinematographer or uh, art director or an editor. You should know everything about film, mm -hmm. and you should be crafted in all of it as as much as you can. You don't have to be an expert in it or anything else like that. But the more you know, the more you can contribute to your to the craft that you are uh, specializing in, sort of like because you understand everybody else's job. You see, um, I consider myself a filmmaker, mm -hmm. even though I'm a cinematographer. I'm a filmmaker. Mm -hmm. I can do. Production design. I can do editing. I can do all kinds of things. You know, probably not very well, but I know and understand them. And I can do them, and like uh, I'm appreciative of their contribution and everything. And so that enriches my craft. Uh, sure, because uh, if I may put a word or two right. into your mouth, because by being the director of photography, you're the crew chief, and you can make their jobs look better when the finished product by understanding what their craft is all about. That kind of thing, and yeah. and it works. If that's the way you want to put it. Well, uh, that's, that's <laughs> I wouldn't put it that way, oh, okay. Jay. But nevertheless, nevertheless, uh, excuse me. I nevertheless, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I think I'll be up, like uh, you ready to sort of tilt and oh, yeah, find out what kind of an operator you are. I'm I'm rolling. Hey, <laughs> listen, we had a wide shot, so we 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 caught that totally. Oh, okay, all right. So, so so that's how I got started. Um, I have no animosity uh, towards. Uh, towards the union or, or anything else like that. I think, I think many people, management and unions, have been uh, fairly uh, self-serving and stupid in terms of like understanding that we're uh, all in this together. Mm -hmm. Management, labor, uh, everybody. Huh? We're, we're all too much uh, thinking about feathering our own caps and everything else like that, rather than like on a film. If we're not all pulling together, if we're not all doing it uh, well and everything, am I uh, wrecking the sound here? No, you haven't bet it yet. Okay. Um, then, then, then I don't think we're doing it as well as we, we could be doing it. I think that uh, I'm hoping for an era, uh, a social era, that that will happen in society in modern society, modern day society, so that, um, so that the divisiveness uh, of management and labor and, and labor with labor and management dividing us to conquer us and all of that kind of thing will uh, ameliorate somehow or other and will come into a better time, hopefully. Any case, um, uh, I still, I love the union. I love what it does for me. I love the, I love uh, my health and pension. And I don't have a pension, but like uh, yet, and maybe I won't have one after somebody steals it all. Uh, but like, uh, uh, I do have health and welfare, 
And uh, thank God for that. And that, the union did that. And um, um, job protection, I don't need it. Don't want it. Don't believe in it. Uh, I believe in the union being an open thing where everybody who wants to be a cinematographer, who has the ability to, uh, to like do a job, uh, should be allowed to like join the union um, and like do that job and pay his dues and get his uh, pension and, uh, and let um, thereby the union become uh, grander, more powerful and um, perhaps uh, um, more um, strong enough to like deal with powerful corporations and things like that. In any case, uh, uh, I believe in unions. Well, America has changed a lot. It's much more corporate yeah. than it ever was before, right. and 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 really, you know, we have to change with that to at least uh, counterbalance it. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, you know, there were there, there have been union problems in our union. I remember in the '30s it was some kind of a hog wrestle or some kind. That's a big strike in '33. Big strike, mm -hmm. yeah, that strike, and you know there were those who went against it and didn't go against it, and all that kind of thing. It's such a sad conundrum uh, for uh, puzzle for for um, for people to be turning against each other. But it's it, it happens all over. Uh, you know the loggers and the truckers in France and. <laughs> Oh yes, the, kind of the the people uh, being put out of business by technological advancements and uh, and um, spotted dolls and um, well, and man management using uh, the divisiveness to break unions by yeah, exactly. pit pitting the directors yeah. of photography against uh, right. against the rest of the crews and and that's what happened in '33, anyhow. Right. Uh, well, I don't think one thing we're never going to change. So I guess we have to sort of learn how to uh, fend for ourselves, meaning uh, unions. Uh, because uh, human nature is basically the same as it always has been. I haven't seen it get any more benevolent or oh, wonderful no. or anything else. Uh, it seems not to change at all. Yeah. Uh, so, but that, knowing that, let's just get everybody in the union so that we have, uh, um, so we have a lot of strength. Uh, from which to deal mm -hmm. with adversarial situations. Not that we want adversarial situations. All we want to do is like serve somebody, uh, our employer, right? Mm -hmm. But if he's like trying to uh, nickel and dime us and work us to death and, uh, and uh, make our conditions unsafe and everything else like that, then man, we can't uh, tolerate that. But we have, in order to be able to fight that, we need to be a big group. Yeah. We can't be divided, uh, non-union and maybets and this and that and everything else. Enough with unions, huh? Well, I want to hear more about what happened to you, though. You, uh, you, you got your movies going. You became a director of photography by, yeah. the, <coughs> okay. by the late 50s. And yeah. you started making more movies. What, what uh, happened? Yeah. Actually, what happened is uh, when I got into the union, then uh, then I started really paying attention <laughs> to my craft uh, because I, was, I got a chance to work with the greats of Hollywood uh, as an assistant to Floyd Crosby, ah. to, uh, uh, as an assistant to um, Lee Garms, and uh, uh, as an operator to uh, Ted McCord, uh, who I consider my cinematographic father, and uh, to... Um, to uh, George Folsey and to, oh, I could go on and on with the names of these inventors of the art of cinematography. Mm -hmm. These are the guys who like came from the beginning huh? and passed the baton on to me and, uh, and, and that in the next generation. And I got a chance to sit there and, and, uh, and, and like uh, watch them mm -hmm. and help them and uh, learn from them. And, um, and see how they did it. So that when I got my chance, I had all of that. And did I, did I, what did I learn from all of them? I didn't want to do it their way. <laughs> 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 so 
I just, but I had that inside of me. Yeah. And then I went and said, oh, okay, why do we have to take the sunlight off them and light them uh, separately or anything like that? What's wrong with sunlight? Or this, that, and the other thing. And so I developed, uh, so when I got a chance to become a cinematographer, which, uh, which eventually, which happened um, in 50, was it 50? What was, I don't know. Let's see, what was the first thing? Oh, Stony Bird. Yeah. It was 59. Mm -hmm. I had been operating on Mutiny on the Bounty for, uh, for um, uh, Surtees. Robert oh, Surtees. Robert Surtees, yeah. another great. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, and uh, I was on the second unit, operator on the second unit. Harold Wellman was the cameraman I was working for. Mm -hmm. um, but I worked on the first unit a lot, too, because uh, two dual cameras, all 65 millimeters. Mm. And um, I came back from that, and a friend of mine that I had uh, operated a film that Ted McCord shot uh, named Leslie Stevens was starting a series called, um, called uh, Sony Burt. And I got together with uh, Fraker, who was uh, a classmate of mine at SC. He, he wasn't in the day program, but he, he came at night. But uh -huh. I, think, uh, I knew him. And, um, and he, uh, um, I got the chance to be the cinematographer on that. Uh, Leslie Stevens gave me that chance, and I got Fraker to be my operator. And um, uh, let's see, God. Everybody you guys are, you guys are classmates. You guys are classmates. That's great. I gl I'm glad to hear that uh, people hang. I'm glad to hear that people hang together. And oh that they yeah. Oh, we're you know. It's like I love Fraker. Huh? He's a brilliant cameraman. And uh, uh, and oh, who else? Uh, my assistant. Well, there's so many. Everybody's a first cameraman now. But uh, so we did a year, 26 episodes of Stony Burke, and then they dropped the series. Uh, and they went into, uh, uh, Leslie Stevens went into um, Outer Limits. Mm -hmm. But the pilot had been shot by another cinematographer. So uh, he, I, I was out of a job now, and he had promised the other cinematographer the series, uh, thinking that Sony Burke was going to go on. He said. And uh, he worked out a, a, a way where I could like shoot every other. Oh, Outer Limits. It was always very uh, yeah. stylistic and so film noir. So I did noir. that for a year. Yeah. And uh, and then uh, what was my first feature. Uh, oh, yeah. And then uh, and then I got a chance to do a feature film, uh, Universal. It was called uh, The Wild Seed, and it was. First time director, first time producer, and first time cinematographer doing a union uh, feature film, uh, Universal Film. And Michael Park, Celia Kay, uh, Brian Hutton was the director, and Al Ruddy was the producer. Uh, and uh, Marlon Brando's father uh, was, uh, uh, was the executive producer. Oh, no kidding. Yeah, along with. Selzman, David Selzman was there, or somebody Selzman? Uh, Selzman? Selzman, I believe. In any case, uh, shot it in 24 days, nice film, black and white. Um, and that was my first film. Then, uh, so that was, what, that was 60, was that 62 or something like that? Mm -hmm. Somewhere mm -hmm. in there, 62, 63. All the time I did commercials also. And, um, and um, anything else you could get to do. Sure. Like uh, when you weren't on a series. Excuse me. And uh, in any case, so, uh, so then, um, oh, so then, I got what? to know Marlon Brando very well. Oh, uh, Bob's indicating that the uh, the siren was getting to the sound. It's okay. Right. Uh, do that last uh, paragraph. Uh, okay. Uh, so then, so then, uh, as a result of getting to know uh, Marlon Brando mm -hmm. and becoming a friend, 
Um, I had uh, an opportunity. He made an opportunity for me to like break into some a really big time film. Mm. And that it's one of those things you call a lucky break, I guess. Sure. How did you meet Bob? Not knowing. Because he was a star of Mutiny on the Bounty, and I was with him for a year. There you go. And uh, he, we were together all the time, uh, drinking and uh, carousing and, uh, <laughs> and uh, shooting, working, yeah, uh, having fun. And he's a great, great man. I, I love Marlon. And, um, and he, uh, he had a picture to make uh, that a German director, Bernard Vicky, was going to do for Fox. Uh -huh and uh, called Mortori. And he uh, approached, uh, Vicky approached him about a cinematographer. And he said, have you got anybody in mind? And, um, or Marlon approached him about a cinematographer and said, have you got anybody in mind? And, <laughs> and, um, and Bernie said, yeah, I was thinking of, uh, James Wong Howe. And Brenda went, ah. For about a minute and a half, and then he went, ah. For about a minute and a half. <laughs> and Bertie was going crazy. What's the matter? What have I said? What's wrong? And Marlon turned and looked at him finally and said, have you ever heard of Connie Hall? <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's how I really got to be here, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Um, because um, it was a big picture. Six million dollars, black and white, back in 19, what, 1963, mm -hmm. I guess it was. Yeah, 1963. And... Uh, um, Fraker was on that 112 day schedule. It's huge. Can you imagine, God, it went on forever. And, but we had the best time, um, a lot of problems, learned a lot, um, very nearly got fired uh, because I had underexposed <laughs> some day for night film so badly that there was nothing on the image and it was like $35,000 uh -oh. a day in those days. And, um, the, uh, oh, I can't think of his name now. I wish I could remember his name right now. Such a, he's dead now, but he was the special effects, uh, in charge of special effects and that kind of thing in, in, uh, at Fox. He said, uh, well, just give me a day. Huh? And uh, um, there was nothing on, on the film, basically <laughs> nothing on the film. Were you on the chalkboard? Huh? Were you on the chalkboard? No, it wasn't chalkboard. Uh, it was, uh, Oh, he had a sailboat, and he used to sail a Catalina all the time. And he's written a book about, about effects uh, from Fox. Um, on quite a, I mean, you know, you'd know him. The second I just his name just escapes me at the moment. In, in any case, uh, he made a high contrast dupe of, uh, of, the, foot, of the negative, off the negative, and, uh, and made another print. And I want to tell you, it's the best black and white stuff you ever saw. He white. found the Day image? Night, he, he found the image? It looks like night, huh? Yeah. Uh, because it's like orthochromatic film. There are no grays in it at all. It's black and white, and it's beautiful. Uh, so he spared my life, uh, my cinematic <laughs> life. <laughs> and they said, look at this great new look that Conrad Hall has yeah. come up with. <laughs> I know. We had been shooting. Uh, it, um, the guy who invented the, uh, the, the, the thing in the helicopter, the uh, Tyler. Tyler. Yeah. yeah. Tyler won an Oscar uh, that year for the shot that, uh, that uh, Bernie and I laid out, uh, which, uh, which he, he operated. And uh, he won an Oscar for, for the invention. Mm -hmm. there. And, mm -hmm. In any case, um, so that was, that got me into the mainstream. And mm -hmm. then, uh, then the man I had worked for, uh, uh, the production, uh, was it, yeah, it was, no, let's see, I forget. 
I got a Paul Newman film next uh, called Harper. Mm -hmm. at, uh, I got to be one of those sort of hot young cinematographers, the youngest cinematographer in the union, you know. I mean, in the, yeah, in the union at the time, I guess. Uh, and um, so, you know how your time comes and you get hot and, uh, and suddenly everything's on a roll and I got Harper and then after that I, I got the professionals and, uh, and tied up with uh, Richard Brooks for uh, In Cold Blood and uh, Happy Ending. And, Well, those are all great films. This is also a, a time of dramatic change in film itself. I mean, they, from black and white, from to, black and white to color exactly. to faster yeah. to faster color, and, and, and it must have. Uh, and you were writing that crest too. You were mastering these different yeah, no. formats and different uh, types of film at the same time. Exactly. I, I was, uh, you know, like, luckily, I had had a chance to shoot a series, mm -hmm. so I shot 26 hours of film. That's quite a number of feature films. Mm -hmm. So the experience you get shooting 26 hours of film in one year is an enormous amount of mm -hmm. experience. You can really hone your craft uh, very nicely, even though you have to make uh, work fast and do uh, an hour in, in five days, you know, all that kind of thing. Or was it half an hour? I don't remember. Uh, in any case, um, um, but then, then, you have, then you get into the big time, which is like feature films. Mm -hmm. And uh, the pressure is pretty strong, the budgets are strong, they're longer, but you have to deliver. And the storytelling is a bigger, bigger and, feel, yeah, bigger. Yeah, exactly, yeah. You have all this 35 foot screen uh, to fill up and all of that kind mm -hmm. of thing. And, um, and I just kept at it and, uh, and, and um, uh, kept learning. And, I'm still doing the same thing. <laughs> oh, you're, you're too modest, Conrad. You've done some, some great stuff. And, uh, well, no, I've done good stuff, but like, I'm still learning. Yeah. Yeah, no question about it. I'm definitely still learning. Uh, this last picture, I did things I'd never done before. I amazed myself even. Um, well, like, what'd you do? Uh, I tortured the film to its maximum, uh, 96. Yeah. Took it right to the edge. Um, um, How'd you do that? That I had, that I had you know, to an edge even more dangerous mm -hmm. <laughs> than Fat City, which I had already, but that wasn't 96, that was something else, you see. I'd started experimenting with torturing film on Fat City, rather than making it beautiful, like Lee Garms and yeah. Ted McCord and all those cats used to do. Um, I tried to find beauty through torture. Uh, torturing the film through uh, extravagant um, um, uh, opposites and things like that, you see. Pushing the contrast ratio. All uh, that kind of stuff, uh, yeah. Overexposing, underexposing. All that kind of stuff. I wasn't so much into underexposing because you don't really see much, you know yeah. what I mean? I was into overexposing and printing down. Uh -huh. Uh, because then you don't get the grain and all that kind of thing. But the, on this last picture, well, you see it when it comes out. It's not spectacular, really. It just, uh, uh, I call it magic naturalism. Ah. <laughs> and uh, I used a lot of mirrors and I used a lot of lights. And uh, uh, my gaffers get used to the idea that I don't just turn on a light and leave it like that. I turn on a light and focus it. Yeah. And I never use a light wide, you know, a uh, flood. Uh -huh. I never use a floodlight. I always focus the light. So it like becomes a smaller area that it covers. And the way it drops off uh, is very natural and smooth and soft kind of light, you see. And um, then, you know, work on whether you go and use from zero foot candles to, to 5,000 foot candles and expose it wide open. Oh. Kind of like, and let the laboratory and the chemicals do the rest. Uh, but it's like painting, I guess, huh? splashing this and that and doing what you feel like doing. You just sit there looking through the lens and, and uh, make this too hot or too cool or just right or too dark. Or, well, Comrade, if there ever was a free spirit cinematographer, you've been it. You've been the guy that, uh, that 
try to go to the sides of the envelope and, and go as far as you can. And, and we love you for it. I mean, it's uh, something that doesn't happen very often to be able to, uh, to, be able to have that freedom, to be able to have well, that. I, I love, I appreciate a lot what we have to work with. You know, I, I appreciate the standards. I appreciate the good films like, uh, will you excuse me? Oh, something? sure. Hello? Who is it? Oh, come on up. Uh, oh, do you want to stop, Conrad? Or? Oh, okay. Well, yeah. No, I, there's somebody delivering there something, a package at the door. Okay. I guess. Huh? You want to cut? Okay, good. Yeah. We're rolling. <laughs> Oh, well, we're back, Conrad. That's the good dinner. Hi, Jay. Back. So, so now we've had that little break. Oh, your ears are cleared Great. again. <laughs> no, 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 just the wax clearing the out of them. <laughs> well, we've been having a grand time uh, getting into all these details of your illustrious career. And, and I mean that without, uh, you, you've been to so many interesting places in the cinematographic world and, and dealt with so many people. Um, Let's, let's continue now, uh, okay. just kind of on a historical basis. We kind of left off with you uh, working as a cinematographer, working in the union. Uh, uh, you, you told us in some of the terrific movies you've made, but really I think you've only gotten about halfway through your career. What's, what's next? Well, okay, let's, um, I've had some great experiences with wonderful directors. Um, Bernard Vicky. Uh, the German that uh, came over here, he had made a wonderful film called The Bridge mm -hmm. uh, about children who were confused about who to fight against, uh, the Allies or uh, their own people, uh, because they were just playing at war and they were protecting this bridge. And, and he came over here, he was used to working with six people. This was back in early 60s. And he was used to working with uh, a crew of six or seven with a handheld air flex and that kind of thing. And suddenly he had all of this uh, big equipment, 125 people and 112 days shooting and Marlon Brando and Yul Brynner and their helicopters with, uh, with cutoff shooting times at six o'clock and all of this kind of thing. And it was uh, very confusing to him. But the one thing he really knew how to do was he was a great visualizer. Mm -hmm. for one thing, and I learned a lot from him about the use of the zoom lens, mm -hmm. how to use it uh, without, without thinking of it as a zoom, just uh, changing the size of the image and that without drawing attention to the fact that you're doing this kind of thing, using um, bodies in the foreground and things like that to uh, pan across from a wide angle and tighten during the, as you're crossing a body and suddenly you're no longer 25, you're a 75 millimeter lens mm -hmm. and that kind of thing. Um, and we had, a, we had a really wonderful relationship uh, uh, on that film. Uh, Richard Brooks was somebody who was a writer Mm -hmm. that came to uh, direction um, um, after he had been a writer for some time, who was a very authoritarian kind of storyteller. I mean, he thought things through so well that he knew exactly the story he wanted to tell, how he wanted to tell it, and like, um, uh, didn't give you that much room to operate in. I you heard he was very I, secretive. He would only hand you one page at a time. He was very secretive also and all yeah, of that kind of thing. That's true. Then he, he would do that. This but is on the, the other hand, and this is it here. On the other hand, when we were shooting the professionals, he couldn't eat without Fraker and I with him. Ah. Uh, because uh, we would sit there and continue to talk about the shooting and uh, the film and how to do it and uh, he would tell us wonderful stories about Faulkner and him when they were writers together at MGM. And, and it was a great experience for me to have um, uh, the past um, brought to me in a kind of personalized sort of way because we came, became very good friends. And uh, then there was John Houston, who was an 
who, who came down when I was a student at SC. Excuse me, I just want to. Uh, Richard, let's think about the kind of change makes this, let's say it's a big change in sound. Right well, much better? Okay, yeah, well. So let's just, uh, it, uh, yeah, it works better now. You're happier. Yeah, yeah. Oh, you're happier. I just want to make a note of it. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, uh, he's learning how to cover his ass. That's all there is to it here. Here, here we go. Here, okay. here plug, plug it in from there, too. All right? Yeah. Um, so so we got, uh, we've got better sound, aren't we glad? So um, I had an opportunity to, to work with uh, somebody who used to be a god. Yeah. Uh, when I was a student and he was making um, the uh, Red Badge of Courage with Gottfried Reinhardt. He came down and showed brushes and talked about how he did it and all of that kind of thing. Who was this? This was? Uh, John Huston. Oh, this is John. Oh, yeah. yes. That's yeah, this is like in god. 1949. Yes. And, and he, he, had uh, been, he had been a marvelous <laughs> filmmaker for 20 years before that, and he continued exactly, for another 20 right, years after Precisely, that. And, and you know, it was like unattainable. The idea of like getting a chance to work with him yeah. uh, was unattainable uh, when I was a student, and then here's, here I was suddenly working with him. And, um, and I had and, 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 and a, the most wonderful collaboration I've ever been in in my life, I think, because uh, he had asked me to go out. First of all, he had brought the uh, production designer and myself in and asked us what we, what we thought this film was all about, this fat city. And uh, Dick Silbert pointed out what he thought it was about. I pointed out what I thought it was about, which was not exactly what he thought it was about. Mm. And he pointed out to us what he thought it was about, lives of people going down the drain uh, and them not being able to put the plug in. Uh, hopelessness, I guess. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so he sent me out to shoot hopelessness uh, for three days before the production. So and I got made you go out and capture an emotion. Yeah, exactly. So I went out and uh, with a uh, camper and three windows with with uh, tripods uh, uh, on 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 hi hats at each window and a quick change mount for an Airflex and a zoom lens and black uh, curtains for the windows in the back and the two sides and shot for three days everything I could find that like portrayed humanity uh, running down the drain. Oh, like and Skid Row and that kind of thing? Skid Row, they were building a freeway in Skid Row trying to move the alcoholics to a different area. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, and so there was a lot of consternation going on. Cops brutality, uh, police brutality and stuff was, was occurring. And I photographed all of it. Uh, he wasn't really interested in the brutality. I was, <laughs> actually. And so, like, he didn't use any of that in the film. But I shot three days of uh, a kind of thematic sensibility of people sitting and time running past and their lives being wasted. Uh, and then we went into the first day's shooting and we shot with actors. And after the first day's shooting, uh, we got all the three days that I had shot with the, with the dailies from the first day's shooting. And it was remarkable how different real life is from uh, acted life, even mm -hmm. though we were choosing to, to do a very naturalistic portrayal. But acting is different than people just like behaving. So he was very impressed with what I had done. And, uh, and I think that boosted his confidence in, in me mm -hmm. and in the fact that I had uh, uh, really caught on to what he was talking about, how this picture should be. Plus the fact that he had discussed about how to shoot it. And he said, Conrad, he said, what I'd like to do is do every scene in one shot. Mm. And we'll get a couple of cutaways so we can shorten it. But at the end of, the, of doing that, all we'd have to do is cut off the head slate or a tail slate and hook all the scenes together, and we'd have the movie. Uh, and we could shorten it by taking out dialogue and putting in a couple of uh, cutaways of, uh, of um, inserts and, uh, and um, uh, cover shots. So, so we started to do that. And he left 
me <laughs> to figure out how to do that. To do John Huston's film. <laughs> because he was involved in teaching Stacy Keach how to play backgammon. <laughs> and he gave him points, and they were betting real money, and he was ten or twenty thousand dollars down, I think. <laughs> and so, so he gave me a lot of leeway. Uh, it was sweet of him. God bless him. And uh, and I did my best to try to like do what he wanted done, and then he would come, and uh, and see what uh, how it was done, and make some changes, and uh, you know, and. And we would come to an agreement, uh, and then we would shoot it, and then we'd do the cover, and uh, and go on to the next thing. And it was just the best way I've ever worked in my life. And it turned out well. And well, I think it's a wonderful film. I think it's my best work, some of my best work, the Fat Fat City. Um, and I think it's a wonderful film. Um, and he's a wonderful man and a wonderful director. He was a guy who had done it a million times. He could just look over and see whether I was doing the right thing or the wrong thing and set me straight in no time at all. Go back to his backgammon game. So, uh, and go back to his backgammon game, you see. And uh, unfortunately, it didn't get to turn out that way because others involved in the production um, wanted a more traditional sense. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we had to go back and shoot close-ups and put in flats when uh, our sets had been torn down because of the freeway building and all mm -hmm. of that kind of thing. So it was subverted, but it was a great experience working with a master like him and a master who knew exactly what to do, what he wanted to do, how to do it, but who allowed somebody else to like uh, the freedom to, uh, to, to be able to help him, you see. And so I learned a lot through that experience. And, and it was wonderful. And so then other directors, I've, I've worked with a lot of English directors, uh, um, some who, who, who are very gifted uh, visually, like, um, well, uh, what's his name? Uh, you know, oh, uh, Hell in the Pacific. John Borman. Uh, John Borman. John yes. Borman. Mm -hmm. He's a, he really knows the visual language mm -hmm. very very mm -hmm. well, but he still worked collaboratively with me, and uh, so I was able to help and and uh, and 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 uh, have a good time doing that. Sometimes when you don't work collaboratively, when somebody is uh, is an auteur type. Mm -hmm. Then it gets to be uh, a little bit sticky, and uh, your job becomes less interesting because you're just sort of taking orders, kind of like. And um, the lighting isn't enough for me. I'm not a lighting cameraman like English cameramen, and some ca some American cameramen are lighting cameramen too. I operate the camera. I, I, I do everything. You know what I mean? I like to be involved with the whole process of of choosing. Uh, the size of the image, how it should move or not move, or uh, helping to tell the story visually, mm -hmm. uh, which a lot of people consider the director's prerogative. Well, and it is, it can be, you know, but a lot, I work with first time directors who don't know what they do when they get on a set. They're writers, they're poor babies. I feel sorry for them because they get there and then suddenly here are these actors, and like, here's all these people standing there looking, <laughs> and like, uh, <laughs> what do we do next? What do we do next? Yeah. And they're, and it's scary yes. for them. So they're, usually they take you in and, 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 and make you uh, part of their collaborative process, which is nice. And, uh, and you could help them a lot because you're very familiar about how it should go and all of that kind of thing. And you can, you can suggest it and they listen and sometimes they think, well, yeah, but not, what if we did it this way, you know? And you can say, yeah. And, uh, and so there's a good collaboration with new people. I like working with new people. Mm -hmm. um, train them right. Um? To train them right. Well, no, I don't mean training them at all. No, I, uh, I learn a lot from new people. Mm -hmm. They ask for things sometimes that, that I might consider uh, ridiculous. Mm -hmm. And then when I start to think about it, why should I consider it ridiculous? And I, and I do it and I find out it's perfectly wonderful, you see. So mm -hmm. they lead you into a new inventive, world that your past experience has precluded from knowing, you see. Mm -hmm. So you learn from everybody. 
somebody who knows nothing about it and somebody who knows everything about it. You learn all the time. Now the visual language, this is always a stumbling block to even talk about for our, our, our people. I mean, a lot of cinematographers don't even know how to talk uh, uh, about what they're doing. They, they know it when they see right. it, and, and that's about the extent of how they'd like to, to express it. Uh, what do you look for uh, in, in the visual language? What, what do you, uh, you know, the, the idea of a pretty picture is, is one thing, but you know, getting into it, editorial? Yeah, okay, well now a lot of people, uh, a lot of people can think in their brain. They can see in their brain. They can visualize here. I can't. I can't read a story and, uh, and, and know what the actors do and everything and think of what to do. I could. I mean, it's not that I can't do it. It's that I, that's not how uh, I become good at what I do. I become good at what I do after I appreciate how the scene unfolds when actors begin to like move and uh, go here or go there mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and develop a kind of uh, naturalness about uh, unfolding the scene. Then I begin, then my mind begins to see that it's better to sort of follow one person or another person or like not see them at all but hear them off stage and all of the myriad possibilities mm -hmm. to tell that story, you see? I see it immediately. Uh, at, so at the rehearsal then, at the, at the at point a, where at, they're... At the time the of set. rehearsal is when I see it and I see it immediately and very quickly and very precisely. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean that if the director sees it differently and like... Uh, uh, has an entirely different thing that I can't like say see it that way too. I can and do and like if he doesn't like uh, what I have like suggested if he's asked me to suggest it first uh, and and has uh, a way of doing it then like uh, I appreciate that way because there's not one way to tell a, good, a story. Of course. There's a, a, a million different ways but and it's a it's a it's a nefarious thing to be able to to describe what it is that allows you to think that you have a good way or the best way. Um, I guess you would have to call that craft and your craft expressed through your talent which is like, um, which is like, you know, I don't know what talent is, but like craft is, is, is like getting, getting pretty precise about, about a good way of, of telling a story, you mm -hmm. see? And that's too complex for us to get into. That's a course. Mm -hmm. uh, all your long course of like looking at films and discussing films and how people did this and... Uh, but all the time you're making uh, these quick uh, decisions when you see the rehearsal and you suggest to the uh, director if he asks you to uh, how you would go about covering this scene uh, and you say we start here then we do that we would cut we do this we do that and um, and you you decide how to do it then it goes to the editor and he does it however he wants to do it uh, later on with with the director and that's fine uh, but you have to decide a way to begin with and uh, it's hard to say it's collaborative always, for sure. You always do what the director uh, wants, but sometimes he gives you uh, more authority to do that and sometimes less authority to do that. So uh, I work anyway. I do what the director wants to do. And if he wants me to, to show him how to do it, I'll do that. If he wants me to help him to, uh, to see it, I'll, I'll help him to see it. If he wants me to do it entirely differently, I'll do it entirely differently, and I'll make it work really good. So stylistically, in, in, a, in a project, uh, do you try to get involved early on with the art director, with the, uh, uh, with the production designer, or uh, I know you come Sometimes. Very, sometimes, if you can. Yeah, it's getting to be less and less now. Uh, uh, the, the production designers are 
choosing locations and doing things that, uh, that I feel would be more advantageous to the production if the cinematographer were involved. But they try to keep you off the picture as long as possible uh, so they don't have to pay you. Economic <laughs> reasons, of course. You know, but uh, I put it in my contract to get a certain length of time. Mm -hmm. And that's, I usually get plenty of time. Mm -hmm. And a lot of directors, uh, like the New York director, uh, no, not Sydney, but Sydney, uh, Lamette. Lamette. He gets a cinematographer in there two months before the picture starts. Mm. It becomes part of the design team. Becomes part of the design team. Mm -hmm. What they do is they work out in their heads what, how, uh, how the director sees it and how to shoot it and make notes and everything. And he gets a picture done in half the time most directors take to, to, to do a film. Yeah. And, but you can't do that unless you've got the cinematographer there. I can't expect him to like get with the program yeah. suddenly uh, if he's not part of the program from the beginning, exactly. you see. Exactly. So getting him in on the program is usually pretty good, early is usually pretty good for the production. Um, I like being in early on the program. I like working with the production designer in, in, um, in discussing color and discussing wardrobe with everybody and in, in, in all the aspects that go into to what we're going to be have to be doing very quickly mm -hmm. later on. And then in terms of a lighting design, do you uh, try to, to settle on a design, a, a, a look for a Well, a, I, a, I get a, a philosophic uh, idea, mm -hmm. kind of, um, it's usually based on uh, something thematic about the picture, like, uh, lives running out and not being able to put the plug in. Mm -hmm. uh, that kind of thing, you see? Mm -hmm. That gives you a kind of, you don't want to do a flossy, glossy kind of thing yeah. uh, if that is what it is that the picture is about, you mm -hmm. see? So you try to find the, the theme of the, of, of the, of the story. Uh, and, and then that kind of uh, brings up a way to approach it, mm -hmm. and you decide um, if you want to romanticize it, if you want to make it naturalistic, if you want to make it realistic, if you want to make it uh, uh, abstract. Um, this, this gives, so there are these stylistic choices that, uh, that govern your thinking. Uh, and then that expresses itself in the lighting, mm -hmm. in how you use the camera, whether you shake it or hand hold it or like tie it off, mm -hmm. whether you move it a lot, whether you don't move it a lot, um, whether you uh, play the picture mostly here mm -hmm. or whether you play it long shot, uh, you know, wider kind of sensibility in the picture. All these things are, are flowing through your mind and are coming to bear on how you're going to do that film. And I don't make hard and fast decisions beforehand. I just get all of that in there. And, and, and then I come up with uh, <laughs> magic realism, oh, ma magic naturalism. Magic naturalism. <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. And what is magic naturalism? Well, I'd be damned, I don't know myself, huh? But, it's, but I do know, in a way. I'll know it when I'm sitting there behind the camera and like looking through the lens and trying to figure out what I mean. And suddenly it comes to me that the sunlight coming through the window shouldn't be balanced at all, but should be so bright that like it, uh, it, it startles you. Maybe there's nothing on the film at that point mm -hmm. or something like that. Because uh, that's not realistic. You see, and uh, and then kind of turn it into a magical sense. <laughs> the, be I, the best uh, cameramen always talk emotionally about their pictures and, and, yeah. and how the, the feel so. of it, and not right. not so much. Oh, I had the key at 100 foot candles and the and the fill at 120 right. or, or or 20 foot candles and and uh, uh, and 10 back lit or yeah. uh, that kind of. Thing. They always talk about the emotion and the feel that you get off it in the final return product. Right. Well, there's magic realism we know in literature uh, that uh, Gabriel Marquez did in uh, 100 Years of Solitude, right? They call that literature magic, natural, uh, magic realism. Why? 
The day I stood uh, facing the firing squad, uh, I thought about the time my father took me to and introduced me to ice. That's magic realism. That's those thoughts, the way that they come out and uh, evolve. That, that's what magic realism is, you see. It's, uh, it, it's how it's put together somehow or other. And magic naturalism for me meant, uh, meant the way it is naturally, but, but evolved more specifically in contrasts that are, that produce the kind of feeling you get when you pull a rabbit out of a hat or like uh, do something wonderful like magic, that kind of feeling. Huh? So that I tried to like pull a rabbit out of a hat or change it into a dove or make it, uh, make the, the appreciation of the way the story was being told uh, happen with those little gasps in there. And that's, anyway, that's what I tried to do on the last picture. And um, I used a lot of mirrors. <laughs> <laughs> I used a lot of hot light and I used a lot of no light. And, um, and I didn't like change the stop ever. I shot the field wide open. And um, I mean, I shot the, the lens wide open so that it's not at its best value. So then I didn't have to use much filtration because like already it's so soft because there's so little in focus. Uh, but I tortured the poor assistant cinematographer. Oh, but what a good guy he was. Uh, oh, and the thing about assistants is they shouldn't be blamed for being out of focus. Operators should be blamed for, for, for not having the focus right. They're looking through the lens, huh? It's not, there's no more parallax view, is there? They're looking through the lens and they can tell whether it's in focus or not. And they can say, whoop, we lost it here, guys, and uh, call it to the attention of uh, the director and do another take and et cetera, et cetera. You work in that atmosphere of no fear and it's not wrong to be out of focus. It's just like, if you want it in focus, uh, then like you should like do it over again. And uh, we would do that. Uh, I had a wonderful operator and I operated a lot myself too. We shot with two cameras a lot and, uh, um, and he was very good. Canadian young man, uh, excellent op uh, assistant. Anyway, um, so that was a, that's how I came to that film. But another film was Day of the Locust, mm -hmm. which is a story about, uh, basically, about the kind of thing that's happening uh, in Los Angeles today. The well, riots from uh, uh, down there because uh, cops beat up, uh, uh, tortured uh, this, uh, this man. Uh, and. And, uh, and everybody, uh, and then the, uh, the law let him off the hook, let them off the hook, rather. And <laughs> everybody couldn't stand it any longer, huh? and went crazy and started to burn Los Angeles down. That's Day of the Locust. Well, also a period piece. Uh, a, a piece. But it was a period piece, period piece right? right? Exactly, right. So, you had, right. so you were able to make a stylistic uh, choices of uh, exactly. filtrations. That, and we uh, went through all of this with John, uh, John uh, Schlesinger mm -hmm. about like how should we do this? Should we, how should we see the failure in these people who were extras who like became so frustrated that eventually at a uh, premiere when they couldn't get near enough to their uh, stars to like, uh, see them even, uh, the frustration got so deep that they rioted. They rioted, yeah. Uh, which is what uh, that story is about. And um, two ways you could do it. I had just not that long ago made uh, a film that was a terrible failure, Fat City. <laughs> yeah. and, and chose to, to, to not romanticize it in any way, to do it in a very naturalistic sense. So there was this choice to be made. Should we do that? Should we make this naturalistic? 
lot of handheld stuff and, uh, and uh, drain the color and uh, do the things that would make it uh, perhaps less romantic and everything else like that? Or should we romanticize it and make it the way the frustrated people wished their lives were, mm -hmm. you see? To romanticize how they felt they wanted to be, that, what they couldn't touch, but like uh, the flame, the beautiful flame that the moth throws itself and burns itself against and all of that kind of thing. So there were these two ways to go. They both sound like good ways. We picked the romantic way, huh? mm -hmm. and we did it, I think, pretty darn good. Yeah. But in retrospect, I think, what if we'd done it the other way? What if we'd made it naturalistic? What if we'd done it like Fat City or, or black and white and uh, made it uh, grim mm -hmm. uh, rather than romantic? Uh, all this crud going down and all this beauty in the, on the screen, you see? Um, I don't know whether we made the right choice. Well, it's always a difficult choice. The, the romantic uh, sells better. We're always in yeah. a commercial medium. Certainly, we're not being paid just to do our own films. It's right. uh, just someone else's vision and the studio's vision. Well, that was one of my, uh, th that's, what, that's what helped me to, uh, to, dis to, to, to like opt for the romantic, which I did, mm -hmm. um, was that I just finished Fat City, which was the other way. Mm -hmm. It was very grim looking. Huh? Uh, photography was all screwed up uh, and everything else like that, which is, uh, which made it more real and believable and uh, frustrating and all of that kind of stuff. Uh, sadder in a way, yeah? and uh, but the film was a failure. Nobody went to see it, mm -hmm. and I thought, God, I don't want to make a film that nobody wants to go to see. Yeah, then you, that's more frustrating. Even yeah, which is which is so frustrating to, to like tell a story and then nobody buys your book or mm -hmm. goes to see your film, well, why? Uh, so, so I'm not sure that I didn't opt for a kind of commercial sense rather than a more artistic sense. But what the hell, I'm a whore. <laughs> <laughs> well, around that time you started working on Butch Cassidy then, uh, was that? Uh, uh, well, let's see, Butch Cassidy was, uh, was actually 69. Yeah. And uh, this was 76, so, oh, so it was before. Okay. So, Butch Cassidy so was way already, before. So you've done Butch Cassidy. Yeah, uh, I'd done bu uh, Butch Cassidy a long time before. Listen, I, we're we're going to do a little cinematographic thing. We're going to pan over to, to, your, to your award here. Now, oh, yeah. and I, I just that was 69, 1969. This is 69. 1993, mm -hmm. long time ago, huh? Well, but I had a chance to win one, another one. But you know what they did that year? What's that? They canceled the category on me. Ah. It was the year Haskell was the year after Haskell had won, um, no, uh, Virginia Woolf. It's when they had two awards for cinematography. One for black and white. One yeah. for black and white and one for color. And he had won for black and white for Virginia Woolf. And the next year I shot more Tory. Uh-huh. And uh, no, the next, the next year I shot In Cold Blood. In Cold Blood, right. Right. And there were like 126, I think, uh, black and white films that year. And we started to vote. And in the middle of voting, the Academy sent me uh, a, uh, a thing and, and said that they had canceled the category. <laughs> and I'm very proud of the work that, uh, that, I'm very proud of that film that Richard did and, uh, and of my work on it. Um, it helps, I mean, it's good, it, it helps the film a lot. And it's, uh, it's uh, interesting black and white, and it certainly had a pretty good chance uh, that year. <laughs> so anyway. Well, I, I, I'd like to point out for the viewers of this tape that you do not leave your Oscar on the mantle. We ma made you put it Thank up there. Thank God you brought that up, by the way. <laughs> because it's in a very obscure spot in my bedroom. That's right. And, 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 and Oscar over, this and particular you, Oscar. It was your idea, Jay, to put it on the mantle. Well, huh? it was Howie's, really. No, okay, I'll, I'll take credit. And, and, and this Oscar has got his own puka shells, and, and so it, it's, it's and, well endowed with uh, puka shells. And it sat on a ledge at the beach in Malibu, and I was uh, living in Malibu uh, years ago. And it's all 
pockmarked and all of the gold is peeled off of it and the lead underneath it is showed. And, and one time I took it in to thinking that uh, I would like have it replated. But uh, they said it, uh, they'd give me a new one. They wouldn't replate it. They said it couldn't be replated. <laughs> and I thought to myself, well, Conrad, you don't want another Oscar. Yeah. You want the one you want. That's huh? right. Even though it's all pockmarked and miserable looking and That's all that kind of stuff. It has personality, you know exactly. I mean? <laughs> it has personality, and I keep puka shells or whatever you call them. <laughs> uh, I call them. Uh, um, what do I call it? What's the Tahitian word for, uh, um, uh, I can't think of it right now. Anyway, book of shells around him and, um, or, yeah. Yeah, he looks classy, he looks stunning. <laughs> and but I'm I, gonna keep him, and if so he's pockmarked, uh, so what? Well, well, tell we us all are like getting pockmarked. Yeah, we're all getting yeah. pockmarked. All of us are getting greater. <laughs> exactly. So uh, tell us about Butch Cassidy. Was it a, a fun movie to work on? Oh or God, it? yes! It was wonderful. I was in love then, and um, and uh, um, I had like unfortunately taken a another movie. Mm -hmm. uh, I was shooting a movie with um, I'd met Catherine Ross on this movie, and like uh, we had fallen in love, and we were uh, working on a picture called uh, Tell 'Em Willie Boy was here. And uh, George Roy Hill, uh, unbeknownst to me, was approaching her about uh, playing in this film, uh, but uh, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. I had accepted a film with, um, I can't think of the director's name right now, and, but uh, I had agreed to do it. Read the script and agreed to do it before I had fallen in love. And, uh, and then, uh, like, later on, George Roy Hill approached me about shooting Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid while I was still working on uh, Tell Them Willie Boy, Tell Them Willie Boy was here. <laughs> and I thought to myself, oh my God, the opportunity of like working with someone you love and uh, on a wonderful story like this, and it was just too much for me. So I called up the director of the film I had accepted and said, look, I got something really important to ask you. I said, could you see your way clear to let me off the hook uh, to like do another film and explain mm -hmm. what I've told you, you know, the situation? And he was really upset. <laughs> it didn't take to it kindly at all. Didn't like and that. like said, absolutely not. And I said, well, I'm sorry. I said, I'm just not going to be able to like uh, um, uh, pass this up. Huh? It's there's it's too strong uh, um, a feeling. And um, so I like turned him down. And he's, I, he probably still hates me, I'm sure. <laughs> but like I got to, we got to do the film and uh, we had a lot of problems. Uh, really? Uh, but not really bad problems or anything. Uh, but um, um, I, had a, I had an interest, you know, it was wonderful working with Paul and, and, uh, um, and Redford. Oh and, yeah, uh, both those guys in their prime. And, oh. uh, God, and they were so good. They they were really wonderful. And George Roy Hill, uh, excellent director. Um, and being with her, and taking our horses up there, and the dogs, and, <laughs> <laughs> and living miles away in a in a cottage nobody had ever lived in, with no electricity and no telephone, and uh, uh, in a canyon that was as beautiful as the Grand Canyon. Mm. I mean, almost as big, middle of nowhere. Great story. It was, uh, it was a good time. And, yeah. it was, uh, and I, I had a chance to, uh, to do... Oh, the sirens are on. Bob doesn't like those sirens. They're going away. This is the city. This isn't out in the country anymore. All right, now we're back. Okay. I had a chance to... Uh, uh, to do a, um, a, a um, anamorphic film 
and to to kind of and to do some interesting things there the idea of the film there what springs to your mind uh, when you're trying to decide how to shoot a film is again looking for the theme mm -hmm. of the thing. Butch Cassidy is about people who uh, are bank robbers. That's what they do. That's their line of work. That's their craft. And suddenly, posses are becoming invincible. Banks are becoming invincible. Uh, all this stuff is uh, technological advancement is putting them out of business. And they don't want to look for a new line of work. <laughs> and the tragedy of like dying with uh, something that has passed you over technologically, like it's happening in, uh, with lumber people, mm -hmm. with, you know, with, uh, with all kinds of, uh, of uh, industries and, uh, and, uh, and crafts uh, in modern day. It will go on forever. Uh, gives you an idea. Uh, the idea was uh, to like use that technological uh, advancement as a thematic thing. How to show it visually? Well, it's, it's to see it uh, at a distance, but up close. In other words, it's here, but uh, so you shoot everything. You, not, not everything, but like you shoot the posse, the thing that's putting them out of business uh, with long telephoto lenses. But you put them at such a great distance that it's a long shot. And so you have this kind of uh, scoped focus on the theme of the picture. Mm -hmm. Uh, the thing that's putting them out of business, kind of like, and you know, and so that so you use the long lenses, and I, you know, all that kind of stuff that you saw the picture. Um, it was a great, it, it, it was it was a wonderful opportunity, and uh, and uh, it was it was nice. It was a surprise, but it was nice to to uh, to, to to be recognized by the academy and. Uh, and your peers for, uh, for the work. Um, I love getting the Oscar. I really do. Uh, it's, you know, it, it's not anything that really means that much to me, but, but it's sure a nice feeling to love. Nice recognition to, to have. To, to have been accorded that honor, mm -hmm. whether it's meaningful or not. Huh? And, we know that sometimes it isn't meaningful. <laughs> well, sometimes the wrong picture, yes. or not the good picture, gets it, or exactly, anything else like exactly. that. But one thing that was sort of nice, uh, after I got it, um, oh, what's the cameraman's name? He just retired, his son just retired. Um, uh, he had a picture up that year. Um, huh? Stradling? Harry Stradling. Harry Stradling, Jr., yeah. came up to me after after John Wayne handed it to me and uh, we were like uh, going out to our limos and uh, whatnot. Um, and he said, you know, his dad had died yes. just before, so he couldn't come to the Oscars, so, so he was there. And he said, you know, he said, my dad thought you were gonna get it. And uh, it was sweet, you know what I mean? It was sweet to, uh, to hear that Harry Stradling Sr. Uh, had 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 thought that, and uh, and like had, and that his son passed it on to me. Um, well, talk I about love that. cameramen. Yeah. <laughs> talk about that uh, picture for just a second. Did you use any particular filtration that you recall that uh, to to? Uh, well, that, I started with the overexposure kind of deal. Okay. On that one, and printing down. All right. Uh, no, no, okay. Torturing the film and torturing things like film. that. This, yeah. this has become kind of a standard uh, technique for you. Uh, well, it, yeah, it's it, it's 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 toying with the film. It's toying mm -hmm. with the standards of the film to find uh, the artistic uh, possibilities in it. Mm -hmm. you see? Uh, okay. Uh, allow me to ask a couple right. following questions. Yeah. Uh, overexposed. One stop. Two stops. Uh, six stops. 
uh, where, where do you go with it? Uh, well, uh, do you, do you, you, rate it, you do find you rate out it? where the edge is. The edge is, yeah. You, you shoot a test mm -hmm. and you, uh, you, you print at a, a kind of normal stop, mm -hmm. I mean a, a, at a normal um, printing light, and then uh, you overexpose. Mm -hmm. And then you start taking uh, the various one stop, two stop, three stop, four stop, and trying to bring it back to, a, uh, to the look you want. Mm -hmm. Uh, to a normal look if you want a normal look, or to a hot look if you want a hot look, or to a dark look if you want a dark look. And you find out where the edge is when you can't do that anymore. Mm -hmm. you see? And then you know, knowing where that edge is, it's usually around four stops, I feel. Really? That yeah. far? That far? Right. Three, you could say, mm -hmm. but four because uh, the labs don't tell you, even though everybody knows it, um, that you can shift the scale mm -hmm. and get another stop out of uh, out of it when you make your uh, IP or uh, your answer print. You know what I mean? Well, it's the marvels of printing, uh, shooting a negative and printing up and down from yeah, that, exactly onto your inner inner positive and onto your into your inner negative. Right. Uh, but you know, but underexposing is wonderful too because you can pick up grain. Yeah. Grain is a valuable storytelling tool. Yes. I mean, sometimes you want the grain. I mean, think of how wonderful. Uh, Day of the Locust would have been all grainy and like uh, <laughs> gritty and and dark and dismal and all of that kind of thing. The way their real lives were, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Not how they would like to have had their lives. Huh? Would have been wonderful, mm -hmm. you see. So it's all good and. We're just talking about craft here. We're right. just talking about learning about craft, learning what underexposure does, learning about what overexposure does, um, rather than just doing the normal thing, mm -hmm. you see? Mm -hmm. Or like making it too contrasty or, or not making it too contrasty, all that kind of stuff. You gotta know all that stuff because each story is a different, uh, uh, kind of, this sounds like a lesson. Yeah, that's uh, okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, and I should be talking to, 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 to children, not to like uh, others, <laughs> whatever no, this, no, is this, is, this is This is for whatever, six, you know what I mean. You guys all know this. No, uh, not at all. I, I, I think that about? a lot of people's careers are, are so limited in, 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 in their, <coughs> what they're expected to do, they, they never get to these parts of, yeah. of the craft. And that's why it's so interesting to talk about it. Uh, you know, when you get the overexposure, uh, what do you get from it? Do you get a, a, a pastel-y look? Do you get a, 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 a look that's drained of color? Uh, yeah, well, you know, something, I, I don't know why I, I like the edge so much. Some people like deep focus. Yeah. I don't like deep focus. Uh -huh. I don't know why I don't like it. I can't really explain why I don't like deep focus. I might like it if somebody else did it. Mm -hmm. I just can't seem to do it. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I just, I don't see it that way. When I'm looking at you, that building out there is out of focus. Sure. You see? So uh, maybe it's just a natural thing that uh, my eyes, uh, the way my eyes see life, uh, actually. Uh, but al also, I think it's part of the language to know that being uh, in focus at a point is to direct the story where you want it to be. Mm -hmm. You see, and I like to do that. Selective. I like, Selective. I like, I like to be in charge of, of like laying out the image so that people are looking where I want them to look, where the story I feel belongs at that time. You see, and not just, well, what are we looking at here, guys? This is in focus. That's in, everything is in focus. Uh, what am I looking at? You see, that's. I guess that's as close I can come to. Well, the well like Picasso goes through his, like his, his blue period and his uh, cr different creative periods, uh, so cinematographers uh, go through their different... Yeah, yeah, ways. yeah. Well, you know, I'm very appreciative of what all of them have done. I mean, uh, I don't do anything different than they've all, like, done before me. Well, uh, you talk you know, about I your mentor. I might take it a little, a step or two um, in, in the same direction uh, and sometimes in a different direction, maybe a little bit, but... It's all been done before, guys, you know. Well, that's right. You talked about your mentor about yeah. an hour ago, uh, Ted uh, McCord. Yeah. Uh, uh, Got him. Get him? Yeah. Good reaction. <laughs> Good reaction. Good. Uh, what, what did Ted teach you as a, a what did he do as a mentor uh, for I'll you? I'll tell you exactly what he taught me. He taught me, he further taught me that I should, I should be, 
an artist. Uh, now that doesn't mean that, uh, that like what people call you or anything else like that, but it's the way you look at things. Huh? It's the way you appreciate life. Uh, it's the way you um, attack telling the story. Um, and that, and that you should, and that it should come from the depths of your soul and heart and mind, um, in a in a kind of organic way, somehow or other. You know that it should. Uh, that doesn't mean you have you don't have intellect working up here, uh, feeding down into this system too. But like. Um, but you shouldn't let this win over this. Um, you're liable to get kind of, uh, what's the word, um, stuck. So, no, that's not the right word. I can't think of the right word right now. But uh, he taught me to be open, to be frightened, to be, to be, uh, to be searching, not to be certain about anything, really. Um, to be, to evolve into what the best thing is. It, it was an attitude he taught me. He looked at everything totally different every time. Each picture was different. Uh, he looked at everything differently, and each shot was looked at uh, differently. There was no sort of like, he wasn't like bringing something to bear on something. Something was like bringing out of, out of the story and everything and the actors and all of that uh, came a, a way he could bring it to bear to tell it exactly, see, or well, uh, rather than knowing it all beforehand and imposing it upon uh, the actors, uh, everybody, sort of mm -hmm. like, you see. So that kind of sensibility is what he um, imbued in me. I call it, it's the artistic sensibility, mm -hmm. you know? And, uh, and um, whether I am or am not an artist is immaterial, but I approach my work as an artist. And uh, that doesn't mean I am one, but that's how I approach it. Terrific. Uh, so I got that from him. Um, and I got a lot of other things. Ernie Haller, geez, what a, God, what a good lighter he was. Huh? He could, I mean, boy, he could, he could light something so quickly. And, uh, and uh, uh, Charlie Lang, oh, all those good cats. Uh, Charlie, could, Charlie could do more with one light, but then <laughs> you'd think, uh, then he would take all the light away from it, practically, <laughs> before he said he was ready. You'd look at his light, and then you'd see all of this myriad flags and, uh, and cutters and things in front of it. You could barely even like see any light coming from it. But it was taking light away from, uh, you know, after he'd put it up there. Um, Jimmy Wong Ha, I learned, I worked with him once as a second assistant, but like I never really learned anything from him except from his films. I learned a lot from his films. Um, anyway, um, did I answer what you oh, asked? Oh, yeah, you're, you're right on it. I, don't, I, I lost myself. <laughs> no, you know okay, I, mean? I don't know where I am. <laughs> okay, well, I'll tell you what, let's, let's, let's uh, take a little corner here and, and, and okay. go for, for a left turn. Um, You've been around the, the union politics for a long time. You've seen, yeah. you served on the board for what, about 10 years, weren't you? That you quite a while. Quite yeah. a while. Uh, and you've seen a lot of the changes that have happened. How do you think things are going? I mean, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a tough world out there. I know yeah. <laughs> we're all living in it. And uh, what, what's going on with you? How do you feel that? Uh, okay, well, uh, once I got into the union, um, um, I, and once I got on the board of directors of the union, uh, not board of directors, uh, executive, executive board, board yeah. of the union. Um, I started becoming part of management of, of unionism. And, um, and I had a lot of ideas that were 
um, that, that other people had. And um, I started uh, putting them forth and found that uh, there was a great resistance to uh, evolving into a more modern ethic uh, in the union. There were those who uh, had started the union, who were involved from the beginning of it, who uh, uh, involved from the beginning of unionism, which, which at one time used to be about protectionism. Protectionism had always, from the beginning of unionism, been a very strong part of unionism. It's not, for me, the strong part of unionism. Unionism, uh, the strong part of unionism for me, is like uh, uh, benefits, health, pension, uh, the continuity of working people uh, uh, to make lives for themselves, and, uh, and the protection of, uh, of that against uh, those who would deprive them of it their employers, you see. Unfortunately, we don't have uh, that friendly a situation sometimes. So, uh, so I was all for that kind of unionism, but I was, not, uh, I was not for the kind where the people in the union were keeping others from being in it so that they could have more opportunity to do well themselves, you see. I didn't feel that that was the right ethic for unionism. I feel that in order to, uh, to deal uh, on an equal basis with your employer, that you had to be as powerful as he did. And uh, that the way to do that was to have people, all the people who could work and do what it is that uh, the union represents, uh, be in that union. Uh, and, you know, made suggestions like, why don't we do what the NBA does huh? and go down to the film schools mm -hmm. with all these people pouring out and no jobs for them and going off and creating all our problems uh, uh, of non-unionism and no work for, for union people and everything uh, of union, of, yeah, of, uh, of, of uh, what do you call it, uh, non-union, uh, and take them into the union like the NBA does. You know what I mean? Jesus, God, they go down and get the best guys and bring them in. Mm -hmm. You learn a lot in film school. Huh? What if we had taken all of uh, the best people and given them some entry fee that would be maybe less than somebody else, some opportunity to like um, uh, apprentice in a way, uh, but like be in the union, be surrounded in that union so they wouldn't go out and like work non-union, you see? Without like having to pay $5,000 like, uh, like uh, you know, uh, somebody like we have to. In any case, uh, all sorts of different and new and interesting ideas which I, as well as others in, uh, on the board of executives who were, I guess that dirty word, liberals, uh, we're trying to, uh, to bring the union into a more uh, modern uh, world, which we saw rapidly happening about mm -hmm. us, huh? and which I wrote a speech about. <laughs> I passed around the executive board, gave it at, uh, uh, at the 1968, was it? I believe, uh, um, 68 or 78. I forget what year it was. No, it wasn't. It was, it was whenever I was on the executive board and nominated to go to uh, the IATSC convention. Uh, probably, thing probably, back in, uh, in Winnipeg, Canada. Yes, probably 78. Mm -hmm. 78, yeah. Okay. And uh, uh, about what I thought should be happening. Huh? And everybody loved that speech. Huh? But <laughs> And I gave it. Uh, to those who, uh, to an IA meeting. But it was like, it was a speech that was meant, it was like driving a battleship into a swimming yeah. pool. You know yeah. what I mean? It was a speech that was meant for a lot of people to listen to. Huh? And I gave it at the music hall and 44 people showed up, I think. 
And so it felt foolish mm -hmm. to like talk about the future when nobody seemed to give a shit about it. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? 44 people, I guess, gave a shit about it. And or this, that's the way it felt from my side of the microphone. And, uh, and then when I went to the convention uh, with the other delegates uh, and offered the speech to, uh, uh, to, I forget who the president of the IATSC was then, um, to be ignored and uh, all of that kind of stuff. Oh, their and, politics uh, are pretty brutal. Yeah, sometimes. exactly. It's all set. And you see that it's all sort of manufactured about who gets mm -hmm. to say this. And, and they only get to say the things that anybody wants uh, in the IATSC to say. And, uh, and, how, and you see what the whole structure of the IATSC is about. It's not about unionism. It's about big business. Huh? And like, uh, you can't have big business until, unless you control all of these little factions, uh, unions and everything else like that. So like afterwards, I tried to get the cinematographers out. I formed uh, uh, the State of the Union Committee and we met down at Wexler Hall and we had to do it secretly so that uh, we wouldn't get the union um, busted mm -hmm. by the IATSC. Uh, trying to think about how to go into the future uh, and change the thinking, the mindset of uh, ancient union thinking. Mm -hmm. Well, it didn't get us any place. Uh, uh, I even wanted to take cinematographers out of the union and join the uh, the directors guild, and met with all of the you know heads of the directors guild and um, Haskell and I and the head of the the guy in Chicago. What was his name? Ralph Kutner or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, the New York guy wasn't here. Or no, he was here. It was, uh, what's his name? The actor, I think. Anyway, we, we, we talked to them and they were interested in, in taking cinematographers in, but uh, we didn't have our act together. And we didn't have our act together because they have this thing where they can like, um, uh, what is it when, when the IATSC can like take, take over the finances yeah. right. and all that kind of stuff? Co you know? Take over the local? Uh, yeah, take over the local. Right, right, because the of, they own the charter. Yeah, they own the charter. They own the charter, yeah. exactly, right. And like, uh, if you like, you could leave the charter, but they own the charter, so they would start up another charter, and then like you'd have the same, you'd have a divisive situation again, you see? We can't seem to get out from underneath the umbrella we're under and be a union of cinematographers, mm -hmm. you see? We're a union of cinematographers and a whole bunch of other people that are in film. And we don't really belong together. Mm -hmm. yeah. Exactly. We well, don't belong together. 669, you know I mean? 669 certainly has. And in any case, uh, I, I fought and struggled and tried and uh, voted. Uh, always, um, <laughs> there was always two of us against 22 of us sure. at the executive sure. board, you know what I mean? And uh, you remember those days that you were there, part of I was of there, it. And yeah. uh, um, I won't say which side you voted on. Uh, <laughs> but nevertheless, um, I finally was removed from the board um, uh, because uh, at that time I had spent a lot of time in Tahiti and, and I forgot to like uh, let them know I was out of the country mm -hmm. and all that kind of stuff. And, and so I sort of lost interest when I saw that what everybody said was going to happen did happen, which was that the, the, uh, that the uh, employers divided and conquered and uh, brought in uh, foreign cinematographers and went non-union and made the union impotent, yeah. basically. Whereupon the union tried to do something about it, but it was too late. And it is still too late. It's finished. Uh, the union has no power at all. The employer can do any goddamn thing he wants to. He can hire anybody he wants to. And the union even helps him do it. Now, he'll hire a cinematographer up here on a non-union picture from overseas with the full idea that he's going to like, uh, all he wants to do is to get him in here so he can hire him again. You see what I mean? And like uh, the union then goes in 
and organizes that picture has to take a whole bunch of people in that, uh, that like maybe d are just relatives of, uh, of, of uh, producers or something like that, you see? It's, there's a big mix-up going on. And it's, it's from the fact that we belong to a group that we don't belong to. It's like Bosnia, Herzegovina. Huh? Mm -hmm. It's that kind of a deal. Muslims, Croats, Serbs, and man, you ain't going to figure it out, huh? It's going to go on forever. Mm -hmm. So I got out of unionism. All I do is like rant and rave here. I'm not ranting and raving, not actually. Not at all, you no. Know, no, no, no I don't rant and rave anymore. Uh, because in a way I'm powerless to do anything except protect uh, what I believe in the way it should be. You see what I'm saying? And, and, so, uh, and so we have been taken over by, by the employer. And, um, but we've been stupid about um, working with him to, do, to get, give him what he needs. Uh, and so I don't know where it's going to go, but I don't see it getting better. Just like I don't see uh, the Balkans getting any better uh, without more bloodshed and all that kind of stuff. Well, a lot of your ideas have been still kicking around there, and they, they have not gone. <laughs> I'll bet, huh? Yeah, they're still on there, and, and a lot of them are coming to fruition. You'd be surprised. Really? Uh, yes, absolutely. Listen, I want to give Howie nice. a chance to say a couple words before we run. We've got about yeah. five more minutes here, and I'd like to give Howie a chance to get a, uh, a couple of words in. Hi, Connie. How are you, Howie? Nice to see somebody my age. Uh, and uh, <laughs> oh, yeah. you're not that old, <laughs> really? Bob, I would never have guessed. Huh? Well, I could tell you stories that'll tear your heart out. Oh, he uh, looks like a kid. Look at him. Well, this has been a great interview, and I'm, you know, in a way, I, I have about 150 questions in my mind. But uh, I will confess on 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 video that. Uh, we were on the board together. I voted for you sometimes, and I guess it was. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I don't mean to be sounding like a guy who's uh, right about anything. I just know that, like, we were wrong about a lot of things on that board. And we were yeah. right about a lot of things. That, a few. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, anyway, I, I have, you know, one basic question that actually has been such a great interview that most of the questions I have have been answered. But, uh, uh, if you were to uh, give advice to a graduating class of young film students or people trying to get into business today, what kind of advice would you give them? Wow, I tell you, it's uh, the advice I would give them would be that the world has, has become more complex the visual world has become more complex. We, don't, we not only have television, but we have, uh, we have cable, we have access to, um, to, we have computers, we have things that we never had before, and that there is a giant world of visualization out there uh, that, is, that is movies and more. Um, and in fact, it's so it's so gigantic. I mean, they just they're thinking about putting 500 uh, cable stations or something like that uh, available. Well, I guess those are going to be taken sometime. But it'll be in education. It won't be just movies. They're just entertainment. You know, there there's so much in in the visual arts and movies uh, and documentaries and things like that to, to go to that you shouldn't feel hopeless that when you get out there's not going to be anything for you to do or anything else like that. But I don't know how to advise anybody anymore because when I was doing it it was just it was just movies you see and or television and I know how to do that but now it's gotten to be a worldwide thing uh, I would love to see uh, what Vittorio Storaro always wanted, and uh, which was that 
uh, for us to be able to work wherever we wanted to, and that kind of thing. And uh, hopefully that'll happen someday, that other countries will open up, that their industries will, will, uh, will flourish, um, unlike now. Ours seems to be the only one that really is flourishing. That's true. That's, that's great advice, uh, Connie, and, but just to prove that we're all victims of time, our time has run out on this tape. So I'm going thanks, to pass, I'm going to, thanks a lot, I know you. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to give the mic back to uh, our moderator. Uh, and Conrad, thank you so much for, for your time. You're very welcome. Uh, this, is, this has been more than a little bit stimulating. <laughs> <laughs> Should I uh, maybe sign off uh, with oh, a yeah, good let's get, blow let's get the, here? Oh, yeah, let's the right? <laughs> Out of breath, I guess, huh? Yeah. Say goodbye, Connie. Okay, adios, Bye, everybody. Connie, in behalf of the, uh, of the uh, Heritage Committee and the locals, we really appreciate it. Thanks so much. It's been a pleasure. And he said goodbye to Tahiti. Adios. And goodbye to Tahiti. Yeah. <laughs> In what? Oh, in Tahiti. Uh, yeah. um, oh, wait a goodbye in Tahitian. It's. Uh, Shalom. Wait a minute. I don't speak Tahitian anymore, but like. Uh, Yorana is hello. Goodbye, Yorana. Uh, Yorana ah. <laughs> is hello, but what's goodbye? Goodbye. We're never going to say goodbye to you, bud. I don't know what goodbye is in Tahitian. There is no goodbye in Tahitian. There's only hello. <laughs> Shalom. <laughs> exactly. Okay. Okay, guys.